Do you dream? Do you dare to dream? In this place, our dreams may take form, but the ravages of time and endless march of reality render them to nothing. I can show you the way to the end of suffering and hope, the pain of dreams. Greetings, Kindred. I am Voivode Maquette, and welcome back to Our World of Darkness and a very special video because this is our very first ever double feature for Metaplot Monday. Now, we also have the Cult of Shalim lore sheet, which has been released in tandem with this video. But in this video, we're going to go more into the deep information of the Cult of Shalim because this is a very very interesting addition to the world of darkness. Now, you all can thank Lucas Alvis. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. I hope I am. If not, I apologize. Our community member who is interested in information on the cult of Shalim for the idea of doing this double feature because both the lore sheet and this information within Cults of the Blood Gods supplement is it's all worthwhile if you're really trying to deep dive into this cult, into this La Sombra run religious faction that's trying to bring about the end of the world. Now, we are going to go through this piece by piece, and I'm going to discuss everything as we go along, uh, basically reading a section at a time. This is going to be a, a bit of a longer video than we usually do on Metaplot Mondays. The hopes and dreams of all kindred hang by a silver thread. Their very belief structures have been fundamentally shaken by their changing. To the scientists, it seems that every angle they discounted in their studies as sorcery and magic has been shown to exist, and all they have worked for has been for naught. To the religious, they are now agents of evil, immortal and outside of God's plan. Kindred survive by hanging on to their core values and hopes, the dreams that make them who they are, and convince them to drive on to the next night without falling into despair, and eventually the death-like sleep of torpor. The cult of Shalim preys on this fact in the most unusual ways. Its agents pride themselves on uncovering the great loves of a person's life, the small joys and bonds that make their reality bearable. They then call those things into question, expose their temporary natures, and sever them leaving the target to their predations, left with no choice but to accept the central doctrine of their faith, that reality is suffering. In some ways, the cult of Shalim resembles the ministry in their methods. The difference is the ministers and the church of Set wish to replace the void with faith where the cult of Shalim cares only for the void. Adherents of this faith do not seek a blissful, endless orgy of experience where all the bad is eliminated. Their creed is far less utopian and difficult to swallow for all but the most foolish. Shalim's followers believe that the elimination of the suffering of existence can only come at the cost of its joys. It is a fact of existence that happiness will turn to sadness pleasure to pain, and any utopia will crumble with corruption and heresy. This black priesthood preaches how a perfect world cannot exist while the world itself exists. This madness is what comes from staring too long into the abyss, as many La Sombra mystics have done over the centuries, 
looking for truths in the emptiness that seems to consume their very souls. Many of those who have studied the secrets of oblivion have spoken of a presence in the emptiness, a formless consciousness that seems to observe them and whisper back. When a Methuselah proposes that this is the very creator, not just of the clan, but of the universe itself, it's difficult for the egotistic and morbid minds of the watchers of the abyss to refuse the seemingly simple truth. The first priests of Shalim have been recruited and their numbers are slowly swelling. In cities around the world, as the tendrils of their faith grow, they reach out to each other, targeting the disenfranchised and the desperate. Those who appear to have lost everything in life and unlife, they call to them and speak of the sucker of emptiness and the bliss of the end. Bidding them with a baptism ceremony, they ask the question the cult's founder first asked them. Do you renounce God and all his works and his paradise? With their every tie to reality broken and their mind shattered from loss upon loss, what can they do but answer, I renounce? The cult of Shalim is a cult that focuses on the destruction of everything that makes you happy. Their members are the first people they target. This cult literally does shatter the humanity by shattering everything that is human in its cult members. Now I went ahead and I translated the Latin, as I, as I will if that comes up again, because that is important. That, that is important. The idea of do you renounce the creation? Do you, do you renounce all of creation and everything that they offer to you in this so-called paradise? Because they want you to understand that the idea of paradise does not exist in their mindset. That the only way to truly achieve peace is the destruction of all and you are here to help everyone find peace by destroying everything that means anything to them it actually kind of follows very well onto the concept of the path of night but it's a darker version of the path of night and i can really see why the la sombra are so dragged into this the beckoning provides great opportunities for kindred who would previously have been perpetually held down by their immortal overlords. However, the opportunities come at a cost. Something has summoned all those kindred away. And whatever it is, it has kindred guessing all over the world and asking questions of their long-held beliefs. Like any good conspiracy theory, the provision of plausible answers to those questions can turn into certainty in the minds of the most hungry to understand. Kindred scholars have long spoken of the great and powerful founders of the clans, the Andaluvians. In the modern nights, it seems logical for kindred to believe these ancient masters have summoned their closest children to their sides, much in the way some of their own sires may have called them through the blood. Most who claim to be messengers of these entities are quickly struck down by the logical authorities as threats to the masquerade or as agents of the apocalypse. Only the quick-witted and sufficiently powerful remain elusive. One such kindred is the ancient La Sombra known as Apollyon, the Traveler. The cult says Apollyon travels the world in the form of a great black mass sliding along the floor of the seabed, constantly communing with what he believes is his sire, the voice in the dark. The semi-torpid state 
guides him around the earth as he reaches out into the minds of the kindred of his bloodline he feels nearby, seeking those with a predisposition he needs. Those who have suffered great loss and who are asking the existential question of what it all means. Nothing. Nothing is the answer he provides. There is no meaning save that which you assign to act itself. He comforts them with the knowledge that all the Sombra have deep inside themselves, that they are part of a great destiny, and that destiny lies in oblivion. Not only will they end their own suffering, but that of the entire world. This lofty goal can only be achieved through Shalim, of course. Apollyon preaches that Shalim is the first kindred and the master of the emptiness that existed before the universe itself existed. He speaks of the primordial deities such as Erebus from the ancient cultures and links them back to Shalim, their true identity. Shalim is the kindred from whom the first Lasambra arose, the progenitor of all bloodlines and guardian of the purest of those who retained this link the primordial dark. Once Shalim wakes and hears the calling of his children, he will destroy the cancer, perverting his perfect blackness, and return the world to the state of nothingness. In a stroke, war, suffering, disease, unhappiness of all kinds will be expunged, and all consciousness will become one with Shalim. All will return to God. All will be God. Several Asambra have now knelt before him in one of his guises, pledging the remainder of their time in existence to ensuring its eradication, promising to be the scalpel that will cut reality away and reveal the peace of emptiness to a grateful world. Out of nothingness explains the fact that what we're dealing with is the concept of La Sombra who believe in a dark version of the egg theory that all souls are one. And once they die, they return to God, building that God stronger and creating an eternal peace and comfort within his arms. And this Apollyon believes that and preaches that Shalim was the first kindred. This takes us out of the common Cain theory. This gets us away from the idea of Set being the first kindred. This here is a whole new foundation story for vampires, that Shalim is the great absorber, and kindred are their agents of the great absorber, which is why they feed on life, why they take lives, which eventually just return to Shalim. Apollyon believes that Shalim is his sire, or at least he hears his sire's voice through Shalim. As a relatively new cult, the Shalemites maintain a somewhat covert presence in many cities throughout the world. Apollyon's priests have been mainly recruited from around coastal Mediterranean cities where his trek takes him, but they have subsequently branched out to various areas of the world. The most well-known of his followers is Michaelis Basaras, probably butchered that name as I always do, a La Sombra in the city of Chicago. However, cells of Shalemites can be found in the United Kingdom, Brazil, South America, and even Egypt, where they silently exploit the schism within the ministry and seek to twist their zeal to Shalim's purposes. This explains that while the primary source of the cult of Shalim is going to be located around the Mediterranean because that's where a good amount of elder La Sombra who have just lost, just, just lost their purpose reside, that this, this cult can be found all over the world. But the idea that Apollos is is literally just traveling along, along the ocean floor, around around the 
around the Mediterranean and just infecting his bloodline with his his thoughts of entropy is a pretty interesting fact that that Apollyon is actually almost like a dark messiah that's just spreading the concept of Shalim throughout the world and his followers are branching out to different areas. The rank of priest is the highest a cultist can aspire to, however, rank is generally not a concern of those joining this cult. Once one has embraced the purity and perfection of emptiness, such trappings are mere words in your mind, though the priests are those who speak directly with Apollyon and through him to Shalim itself. The cultists consider themselves equal since they are all part of the same problem. They often meet in what appear to be nothing more than self-help groups or religious discussion classes, discussing their problems and their hopes for the future. This is a guise they use to lure those seeking help to their side and to gain their trust. Priests of Shalim are always La Sombra, who have been touched by Apollyon. His predation vary from subject to some subject. Some kneel having only heard the word and accepting it, such as Rabbi Basaris. Others must be more directly convinced, such as Gamal Hajar of Cairo, whose every happy memory was annihilated by the Methuselah over a period of several months. Each one of them is only released by Apollyon when he considers their faith in the coming end to be incorruptible. So Apollyon literally corrupts his priests directly. He himself, Apollyon, messes with them, destroys everything that they love until they are ready to move on and teach others. And it's kind of an interesting thing that this, this cult, it's, I mean, I can't even say that it's not a cult of personality because it's not wrapped around Apollyon, it's wrapped around Shalim himself, who, if anybody is talking to Shalim, they're talking through a priest, through Apollyon to Shalim. So the idea that the abyss itself is actually discussing with him and pushing that information to other people is, it's a very interesting way of putting it. The fact that he feels the need to corrupt, to make those incorruptible is, uh, that's bizarre, but it's also quite understandable considering what the end game is. Very little of this young faith has been formally codified. Indeed, their practices and approaches seem to vary from cell to cell. Only through their correspondence do the priests share their stories of success and failure, refining their methods. So this is a growing cult that's creating new practices. And where I do believe that a lot of the ancient um, uh, uh, abyssal mysticism has gone into this, I can considering the fact that to practice I, I know i'm jumping here but considering the fact that to practice abyssal mysticism you must stare into the abyss i do think that this cult of shalim is actually a modern taking on what has been going on for centuries it's just gaining momentum they write using a coded cipher that involves translating their writings into numbers using the system of gematria for that reason all the coded letters are written in Hebrew, and priests are required to learn it by rote to ensure their messages can be understood. These letters are often disguised as missives being sent to their distant sires or friends, and it is not entirely strange for such correspondences to be encrypted to preserve not only any secrets inside, but also the masquerade should the letters be intercepted. So they use gematria, which is a way of switching your letters to numbers in a very simplified, and I'm, I'm saying this right now in a very simplified 
way of doing it. Basically, what we're saying is that you would have uh, A be 1, B be 2. That is incredibly simplified. That is not how gematria actually works. But it is very easy to do that with the Hebrew writing due to the fact that gematria was actually... Uh, a practice of those who practice the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. Do you feel it? Do you hear it? Is it not like God? New cultists, once stripped of their hope, are brought into the service of Shalim through a ritual akin to a baptism. The priest coats the supplicant in shadow, placing their hands on the shoulders of the new members to comfort them, to hold them steady in the endless, unfeeling darkness. They ask the convert if they renounce reality itself and all its various trappings. But the time this rite is performed, the supplicant's mind is usually broken. However, even those with slight doubts as to the presence of Shalim are faced with the dark truths as they feel his presence in the cloud. Some emerge claiming to have heard an indistinct voice and even to have received visions and instructions from the master of the cult. This very well, in my opinion, could be the idea of taking them through an abyssal walk almost so, so they actually feel the presence of the abyss itself and this can be quite jarring to anybody who's never actually gone through that but i do have to say that in chicago by night in the la sombra section being able to walk the abyss is a part of practicing oblivion the end goal of the cult is clear though the method of achieving it has not been made clear at all. Different priests preach different ideas on how to bring about the coming end. Others say that the cult needs only be ready to embrace it and focus on eradicating those who would prevent it. In general, the cult targets anyone who seeks to gain knowledge of their activities with the view of shutting them down. Usually, they seek to utterly discredit them instead of killing them at first instant. Of course, the cult thinks nothing of killing if necessary. The reality of a person is simply another part of what must be ultimately destroyed. Kindred in their service find themselves twisting their humanity and replacing it with a horrific versions of the cult's credo. Fundamentally, though the methods vary, the goal remains united. The cult seeks to awaken Shalim from his dreaming and bring about the end of reality, uniting everyone in the great heaven and bringing them back into oblivion from whence they came. Practicing this is going to set you basically on a path of enlightenment. Now, whether this is a corrupted version of the path of night, which makes sense to me, is up in the air. The cult has no known apostates, or at least any who have tried to leave the cult haven't been willing or able to speak of their experience. But it does have many critics. Failed conversions would be the first among them, since nothing embitters a person more than finding out that the people who purported to help you were sabotaging your every attempt at happiness. Investigators and kindred who tend towards cynicism are also opposed to the view of this cult and tend to treat its members or those who spend too much time around them with suspicion. Some princes are aware of the cult's presence, but see them as little more than an esoteric distraction for the kindred of the city. If the cult seems benign and gives no sign of their 
intention to annihilate the prince's domain. Those who are aware are willing to tolerate their activities. The first defense of the cult is secrecy, however, and they tend not to formally announce themselves and avoid associating outside of their joint activities in places where they know they can speak freely. Malkavians often feel nervous in the presence of Shalemites. They recognize madness when they see it, regardless of the veneer of civility it is hiding behind. I like the idea of the prince who knows that the cult of Shalim exists and doesn't care. That is a very interesting... Um, it, there's so much denial there, but truthfully, if you have a group of La Sombra who are meeting in secret, I mean... As a prince, do you truthfully trust that? I mean, that in, in my opinion, like, even if I didn't know anything about the cult of Shalim, if I knew that my La Sombra were meeting, I would be terrified of a Sabbat revolt. The cult's symbol of a hollow person, often portrayed as a simple human figure with a hole cut from the center. While this may seem a quite morbid symbol, Evan Singh a great depression the cult would tell you that is the hollow they revere above all taking away the human shape around it and the sadness of the symbol is gone there is nothing depressing about emptiness unless you obsess yourself with the never-ending task of filling it it's rare for cultists to identify themselves by such outward signs. Instead, they speak the phrase Shin Lemed Mem to identify themselves to each other. This simple greeting is usually enough for cultists to recognize it without being suspicious to outsiders, since it is the root of the traditional Hebrew greeting Shalom and of the cult's eternal master. Cult priests carry with them small books, normally bound in black leather, containing lists of dates, places, and names. These indicate sightings of Apollyon by their brotherhood and list the names of targets of his predation for induction into the priesthood. Through their network, they also suggest promising members of their own cults who the Methuselah may be interested in converting or who may be ripe for the embrace being raised as kindred in the emptiness of Shalim's truth. The idea of that kind of brings about the Ninth Circle Brotherhood uh, in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines uh, with Bishop Vic and and Brother Canker and I, th I can't remember the Toreador's name, but the idea of the human being suspended by the chains in the sewers in, in Brother Canker's area where he was just ripped open in the sun. But the idea of a person who has been hollowed out and the fact that they're not worshipping or worshipping at or idolizing the body itself, but the emptiness part of it. It really does uh, speak wildly about them. What they're going on about is the fact that there is nothing morbid about the emptiness unless you're obsessing about filling it. That is a very interesting thing. Now, the idea of using that term also, which I believe just translates to Shalim is. Shalim is everything. Uh, is a very interesting way of recognizing yourselves also. And it is not something that would really draw that much attention. You can pretty much say a lot of things and not really even be noticed if you're just speaking in a nice, calm manner. That's what the whole point of Vampire the Masquerade is to blend in. And individuals who, who are part of the cult of Shalim have their own masquerade on top of the one that they already have to live. No creature is considered anathema to the cult if it truly seeks to supplicate itself before the master of the abyss. While many of their members are kindred, 
there are a good number of mortals within each cell, often chosen for their position in the local society or access they can afford the cultist to materials or information they require to conduct their activities. The religious community are often among the most widely targeted, but the cult historians and archaeologists, particularly those with interest in Mesopotamian and ancient Greek culture. The cult in Palermo, Sicily, is determined to gain ownership of the site of Castel di Ambro and reconsecrate it as the first altar of Shalim. Through various organizations, both religious and criminal, they seek to achieve this aim. However, the cult fears crossover with the Hekata in this area as they share much of the cult's knowledge of oblivion. The idea that the cult of Shalim is trying to gain access to the, the Castle of Shadows, the Castle de Ambra, uh, is, is so interesting due to the fact that that was the Andaluvian's castle and they want to mark that as the first altar of shalim are they saying that the antediluvian of clan la sombra is in fact shalim or are they saying that it's a priest of shalim or are they saying that it existed at all we do know for a fact that that kindred did live but was it truly an antediluvian was it truly the first of the la sombra that is a very interesting mindset that I am interested in, in discovering. And the fact that they are concerned with the idea that the Hikata might also get involved in this due to the fact that they have their own ideas on what Oblivion actually truly is, is very interesting. Uh, especially for me, considering the fact that I have always said that the use of Obtenebration is like a primordial use of Oblivion where necromancy is more of a scientific fine-tuned version of it because the hikata are more scientifically inclined on one hand the cult of shalim is one of the least expansionist cults rarely seeking converts with any passion on the other the shalomites are among the most pernicious corrosive cults in kindred society even when not trying to be so it's difficult to convince a vampire to give up all hope and material purpose, which is why the Shalomites usually target those who, have already, who are already on the edge of losing everything, or vampires who have already experienced exile, a loss of touchstones, or the death of their last remaining mortal family member. The cult has experienced dramatic success in finding targets and converts in the domain of Fukuoka, which spells ill tidings for the other kindred in the Japanese city. A conservative domain with a rigid hierarchy, Fukuoka has a defined way of rewarding the elders, the malas, and the power brokers while keeping the fledglings and anarchs under heel. Most move on to other domains when they realize raging against the machine in the city is fruitless. But some remain because Fukuoka is what they know, because the underground anarch scene embraces everything insane about Fukuoka's nightlife and myriad of subcultures, and because it feels like abandoning Fukuoka is abandoning a city with a pulse. This is where the cult of Shalim comes in, the Shalomites and Fukuoka appeared organically with their first member, a clanless vampire named Ryoko, having been the victim of the domain's punishment named Oyogo, or the swim, where a vampire embraced without permission, has their hands and feet and tongue removed and their body cast into the Chikuko River. The trial takes place before dawn and few vampires survive the ordeal. Ryoko himself disappeared for three months before returning with her body healed and her mind committed to the worship of the void, which she only recently gave the name Shalim. Ryoko spoke with her fellow mistreated fledglings 
and told them of the wisdom she experienced in the dark waters. And while few listened, a couple tried to replicate her experience. They likewise returned three months later, changed and possessed of a desire to erode the fabricated society that for so long has kept kindred from wisdom. The cult of Shalim appeals to the young vampires of Fukuoka in a few ways. For those with genuine esoteric interests, the idea of finding wisdom buried in the city's waterways holds appeal. As their elders never pass down such knowledge, the vampires of Anarch leanings see the water burial, which may have since attempted with more casualties than returns, as proof of commitment of the movement, and the cult of Shalim as a vanguard against the establishment. Many other fledglings just feel a worship of nothingness is cool, that destruction is enjoyable, and joining a group where wearing black is in, and influence and wealth means less than action in a more rewarding way to spend an unlife than playing gopher for their sires. So in Fukuoka, they're actually, this this is an, a, an anarch movement that there's practitioners in the anarch group that are not necessarily La Sombra who are doing this, that the punishments have actually led into this. That, that first off, that is a sick punishment. If you can live, go for it. You know, that's, that's really messed up, but that's also something that Camarillo does. Um, they also do have a list of what the cult of Shalim's convictions are, allowing you to make this into your path of enlightenment. The cult of Shalim practices a regular dance with self-destruction. Nihilistic cults are, as the word implies, prone to implosion. Such behavior leaves a mark on one's soul, especially if the Shalemite is drawn to destroy others in an effort to prove the pointlessness of existence. The following convictions are common. If just to stave off the inevitability of oblivion for long enough to spread their word. I actually think that's one of the more interesting things is that this is a cult based on the destruction of the world, but they're not actually trying to destroy themselves yet. They want to make sure that the foundation of the cult and the actual practices are succeeding before they allow themselves to go on to their rest. Now, the Shalemite convictions are never allow yourself to celebrate life. Life's purpose is to end and you can help hasten it. What you must never ever do is to make the mistake of seeking joy through life's experiences. So. You gotta be miserable. <laughs> Never lose your temper with failure. Whether faced with your own failure or that of a new convert, anger is a wasteful emotion and failure is best addressed through passivity or correction. So in other words, throw in a temper tantrum. Basically, don't frenzy. That's, that's the big thing on there is that you're not here to punish. You're here to bring about the end. And the more recruits you have that can do this, the faster that can happen. So the last thing you want to do is make them feel that they can't do it. You want to bring them up to let them know that they can bring the world down. Always work to impede those who would control chaos. You are not a setite. So allow misrule to unravel naturally, or remove its obstructions without attempting to channel it. I think that actually does set a huge difference between the Shalemites and the followers of Set, or the ministry, is the fact that where the Shalemites are here to cause misrule, but to make it so that it's a self-destructive misrule, the Setites or the ministry are there to cause self-destruction in the ability to find what's beyond it. They're always looking for the next level, not the baseline, which is what the Shalemites are looking for. Only allow embraces that further destruction of society. 
There is no gain to be had from embracing someone as a reward or permitting others to do so. The embrace is oblivion channeled into an unliving vessel. That outlook is such an interesting way of going about things. It really, really is. The idea that when you embrace, you are creating another dark angel. You are choosing. So you need to choose wisely if you embrace at all, due to the fact that you are only looking for more people who are able to bring about the end in a more, I want to say haphazard because it's not a controlled chaos, but it really isn't. It's, it's more of a, you, you can't just embrace to for the sake of embrace. It's more of a this person is going to help bring about the end. Not succumb to the allure of prosperity. The less you own, the closer you are to nothingness. Absence is utter freedom and material objects tie you to life. This is interesting with the fact that I'm kind of a minimalist myself. Um, I have, I'm by all means, not a uh, mattress on the floor, four sets of clothes, you know, get along with what you have minimalist, but I try not to bring things into my life that aren't going to just bring me joy. But these guys are straight out minimalists to the point of you do not need these things because they tie you to life itself. Where I kind of go with minimalism because I feel like it separates you from life itself. Never maintain or protect more than a single mortal of importance. While the need to cling on to the kind is recognized as an anchor in the temptuous ocean, more than one is an extravagance. Basically, you're not allowed to have more than one touchstone. That's pretty much what that means. You need to have something that's going to hold you from falling to the beast, but not something that's going to make you want to keep things going. The Anarchs. They seem to want to exterminate us whenever they find us. They believe we serve powerful elders who seek to crush their freedom. They are blind. We serve the absence of all things. The Camarilla. While it's not ideal, it is just another way of getting our children through the long nights. The Camarilla preaches blissful ignorance in all things, and one cannot find fault in that. If it redirects those with curiosity to its ranks. Clan La Sombra, the clan from which we draw our greatest number and inspiration. Yet many of them look upon us with horror, as if worshipping the tools we use is some kind of sin. Clan Malkavian, I believe sensory deprivation is the key to soothing even the wildest of minds. Find a Malkavian and introduce them to our cause. They'll eat it up. Hikata, interesting idea, narrow vision. I'm sure it's comforting to them to think that everything is about flesh and spirit. But for us, it goes much deeper. The Hikata who worship what we worship are known as Nagaraja, but they are few. The Ministry. The snake may shed its skin and pretend to be something that it's not, but we know. The Church of Set is a half measure. They exist only to satisfy their own desires. I love the idea of what they say those things actually are. I, I really do. The concept of that is um, is amazing. The fact that the, the Anarchs want to crush them because they don't fully understand them. The Camarilla is a place of comfort for the cult of Shalim because the Camarilla, for the most part, don't care what you're doing as long as you don't cause a problem. But the idea that the Malkavians can be easily swayed to their side, the idea that Clan La Sombra is something that they need to be hesitant about because not all of them have come to the realization that Shalim is the true answer. But the idea that the Nagaraja, the bloodline of the Nagaraja in the Hikata, also worship the abyss is so interesting. I love the concept, and I would love to read a story, like read a book, 
that focuses on the call to Shalim and see where the Nagaraja actually fit through when it comes to interaction. These are, in my opinion, what we have now of abyssal mysticism, because this is a mystic practice that uses oblivion to, to successfully use it. Shalemites practice their own brand of oblivion ceremonies. And while vampires outside the cult can learn them with a suitable mala, it's rare for a member of the cult to teach an outsider. Now, I do want to point out that I will be going over these a second time when we get to the oblivion practices in level by level. I do not like to repeat myself, but I really do feel like these three disciplines should really be mentioned here due to the fact that we are talking about oblivion. This is an extended video anyway. Level one, Traveler's Call. This simple ceremony is taught by the cult to all priests before their release into the wider world. Since all priests of Shalim are linked by their common bond with Apollyon, the Traveler, they're able to use his presence in the eternal oblivion as nexus between themselves and their followers. Prerequisites Oblivion Sight Ingredients the black book gifted to them following their indoctrination into the cult. Process. By using the traveler's call with their black book in hand and the name of another Shalomite in mind, a priest can send a ripple across oblivion, calling the target to their location. Unlike a true summoning, this power does not place a compulsion upon the victim, but does alert the Shalomite being contacted to the vampire's current location through a repetitive flashing vision of the scenery surrounding the calling kindred. System. The cultist must possess their black book and know the name of another Shalomite. The vampire's player makes a ceremony roll difficulty of three. The contacted vampire can choose to ignore the call, but the flashing visions give them minus two dice in all rolls involving concentration for the remainder of the scene, at which point the call disappears. A critical win by the vampire allows them a single word message to their point of contact along with the vision. So the whole concept of this discipline is pretty much like summon, but it's not invasive. It's more of the idea of being able to let them know that there's a call of the religion. This could be answered by a simple phone call or by possibly going to the individual themselves. It's not that invasive, but it does allow you to contact other members of the cult. Level three, name of the father. Priests of Shalim have all been trained to use their voice as weapons. Slicing through the sugar coating their victims wrap around their love for the world by invoking the name of the Dark Master and calling for his aid. They channel a fraction of his power into an adversary and cloud their mind with shadow, causing them to stand dumbstruck by the emptiness of oblivion. Prerequisites, shadow perspective. Ingredients, the ability to speak ancient Greek, eye contact with a victim, and five charcoal sticks. Process. The priest invokes an incantation in a dialect of ancient Greek, invoking the name of Shalim as they crush four charcoal sticks in hand. These words are spoken while making eye contact with the victim. Therefore, the victim must be able to see and hear the user for the power to be successful. Upon crushing the final charcoal stick, a shadow crosses the eyes of the priest and those of the victim, leaving the eyes of each participant entirely black as the victim succumbs to a crushing sense of despair. Those who have experienced this power and lived to tell of it speak of an all-consuming darkness closing in around their thoughts and robbing them of all sensation. The last thing they recall is a distant, rumbling laughter echoing in their mind. The system. The vampire's player 
makes a ceremony roll versus the victim's resolve plus composure. On a win, the vampire may activate this ceremony's effect as long as they're in the victim's presence. Upon activation, the victim is paralyzed with despair for a number of turns equal to the margin. While under this effect, victims cannot see, hear, or experience any form of sensory input except touch and physical pain, which brings them out of the effect. The victim can expend willpower equal to the number of turns. They would remain paralyzed to break free of the power. This power actually reminds me of a level of dark thaumaturgy, which I... It's been such a long time, I can't really remember the name of it. But the Bali, or the Infernalist, lights an incense stick, uh, which causes uh, blindness in their victim. Kind of reminds me of that one, but this one goes so much deeper. The fact that they just become paralyzed in despair, and all they remember is hearing the deepest, darkest laughter coming from the abyss is pretty twisted. I can see where this would come in handy a lot, and I would do this on people on a regular basis, um, <laughs> simply to force them to lose the ability to protect themselves and to feel in despair constantly. This is a good repetitive use weapon on people you might want to recruit. Level five, Pit of Contemplation. Only the most powerful of Shalim's priests have been able to manifest this ability, but the effect is one of the most terrifying and demonstrative uses of oblivion yet seen in modern nights. The ability to cast an enemy into oblivion terrifies even the toughest of kindred. Prerequisite power, Tenebrous Avatar. Ingredients, a pot of ink, three liters or six pints or more of blood from an innocent, the user murdered. An unlit room, this power does not work outside. Process, the vampire personally murders an innocent mortal, likely incurring stains, depending on the chronicle tenets of their convictions. While innocence is subjective, traditional sacrifices are children, virgins, and holy individuals. The vampire then takes at least three pints or six liters of the deceased blood into an unlit room and uses it to paint a doorway on a wall in the chamber. Finally, the vampire splashes a pot of ink onto the blood-painted portal, focusing their will upon the gateway. The priest opens a tear through to oblivion. Anyone foolish or unfortunate enough to fall into the gap is immediately transported into a pocket of eternal black nothingness for as long as the priest sees fit. If the priest is destroyed without releasing their prisoners, any undead prisoners remain trapped in the void unless and until another vampire reverses the ceremony. The priest may choose to pass through the door, but doing so condemns them forever. Some Shalomites do when they feel they have completed their work as part of the cult. System. Following the ceremony steps, the priest player makes a ceremony roll, and on a success, the effect is quick and implosive. The hole opens at the point where the ink and blood mix. The hole draws objects, air, and people toward it. And if they fail, a dexterity plus athletics roll, difficulty of four, sucks them into the pocket within oblivion. While trapped, the victims are suspended in an endless blackness. They cannot see or hear anyone or anything around themselves. Only the priest who conjures this blasphemous gateway can free those within at least until the priest is destroyed. By pouring a vampire's vitae over the painted door, sufficient to provoke a rouse check, mortals sucked into oblivion are instantly killed. This is actually very reminiscent to the Elder Oblivion, <laughs> Elder Oblivion. This is very reminiscent to the Elder Obtenebration power of Oubliettes. 
This was a power where you would just put somebody there to forget about them. The fact that they brought this back in, but it's specifically for the Shalomite rituals is very interesting. I also like the fact that the uh, the the at, that if the priest who did this dies, somebody else who knows the ritual can reverse it. But until then, it's just not going to happen. The fact is, they're just stuck in there. And then I guess my final thought is the fact that anybody who believes that their work for Shalim is finished, they just put themselves inside this oubliette to basically be absorbed into darkness until they fall into torpor and just don't exist anymore is is kind of interesting considering that if a priest makes this and goes in themselves no one can get them out because they're technically not dead so nobody else can get in there that's just that's interesting so those are the rites of the shalomites and uh call to the blood gods uh, no no matter how many times i read through it just always tends to just strike up so much imagination in me because of the the amazing things that are in there i hope you all have enjoyed this double feature on the cult of shalim because the lore sheet is great but it really doesn't give you a taste of what the cult truly is and i think cult of the blood gods has really given a good point on that one the fact that there's only three levels of this abyssal mysticism um, is is kind of sad. I really wish there was a ceremony for each level. I wish there were five available or possibly even one per uh, level. And I think the big reason why they didn't just do five is because it would have dictated what your character sheets as playing a Lasamra Shalomite would look like because it would mean that you'd have to take specific disciplines and they really didn't want to just do ten different disciplines, 10 different ceremonies uh, for the cult of Shalim. So I am Voivode Maquette. This is Our World of Darkness, and this has been an ex a special extended look into the cult of Shalim in Cults of the Blood Gods. Thank you for joining me. Good evening.